Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm Angela Fernandez. I, I teach at the University of Toronto, so I'm in law, but also in the digital industry. And um, I'm going to be talking to you today about the topic of for human animals. Um, so here the idea is to sort of introduce you to this idea of the quasi hood status um, and whether it can bridge what's often treated as a default model between property and personhood as status for non human animals. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about the general idea, um, how it works, and then I'm going to ask about whether it can be used to work for natural entities in a way that might dovetail with the, 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 the rights of nature. So it's probably too much to do in 20 minutes <laughs> because just explaining the quasi thing takes quite a long time. But um, I would recommend to you the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights of Public Policy has a Fundamentals in Law series. And so there's a video on there where I'm just talking about the quasi hood idea and also a paper as well. Um, is, uh, our, 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 our earlier version was also published in 2019. Okay, so um, the traditional um, and usual position amongst animal law scholars and philosophers has been that whatever status we use for animals, it can't be the same as the one we use for natural entities, okay, like bodies of water, forests, and so on. And why is that? Well, because what we um, are often focusing on is sentience, at least since Peter Singer and the utilitarianism branch of things. So we sort of think of this as sentience versus dignity. However, I'm taking a nod here from um, some of the scholars in the room, um, like Eva Burnett Kempers and Lisa Kirky, as well as some others like Lori Gruen and Martha Nussbaum, and really, I guess I'll generally um, categorize all the Kantians, um, that we should be paying more attention to dignity. So instead of thinking of sentience versus dignity, we should really be thinking of sentience plus dignity. Um, and asking, um, in addition to, to, to uh, sentience, what dignity would elicit. And here, I think the answer is that we get respect in the case of intrinsic worth, which is yeah. really what many people are, um, uh, you know, want um, when they're entering into this um, conversation about non-human animals. Okay, now dignity uh, itself, and as many of you know and have contributed to this debate, it is, it is quite controversial. Um, and um, it's going to lend itself, though, to non-animal specificity in the way that sentience can't, just for, for very obvious reasons. You don't have a biological entity there, um, and you're talking about something more general. Um, you might think this is good, um, or you might think this is bad, depending on how you feel about this, whether um, you, know, you, you want the animal specificity or not. Um, but some philosophers have been arguing that given the ecological crisis, it's uh, you know, not leaving us with much of a choice when it comes to deciding what or who are, are, are our most important entities and how to protect them. So consider this quote um, from this really great book. And part of the reason I'm putting it up here is just to tell you about this book in case you haven't come across it yet by Melanie Challenger. Um, so here the quote reads, animism is the belief that all objects, not just animals, but also non-living entities and places, perhaps even words, have spiritual essence. Given the current unprecedented ecological crisis and the disengagement from nature that many people feel, it is perhaps unsurprising that animism is making something of a comeback. And this is uh, Michael Reese, he's one of the contributors to this collection. So I'm not so sure about calling a desire to respect all entities animism. Um, however, this quote did catch my attention because it points to a pragmatism that seems to be very true. And I think this is how more and more people are feeling. Um, and really, uh, why not be ecumenical? And I know some of the other sessions are going to talk about this, like the one about is, is rights of nature, is it worth it, and this sort of thing. But uh, it's good to get our conversation on this going. So in terms of the rights of nature, as Kristen Stoltz argued, and Kristen, I'm not going to point right at you, because you're probably like, oh, here I am. <laughs> but we're going to hear from Kristen more tomorrow. As Kristen Stoltz argued, rights of nature can protect the animals that are part of that nature, including many animals that are not charismatic enough to warrant protection as individuals or at a population-wide level. So really, I think the idea here is a kind of a cue to, it's, it's all hands on deck. And so what I'm wondering is whether um, this uh, might work with my idea of quasi-property, uh, quasi-personhood with this status. Okay, um, I didn't know I was gonna be moving back and forth to let you see the slides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's keeping me on my toes, which is good. Pretty tired, <laughs> including me. Um, but uh, 
I want to just to start by telling you about um, this book of mine. It's, it's really my entry into animal law. Uh, it was a book about a famous uh, American property law case, Pearson and Post, of a hunted animal, a fox, the person who owned him, and the person who intervenes, or sorry, the person who's chasing the fox, and the person who intervenes and takes him. And it's a deep um, legal archaeological historical study that I did after a number of years of working on this case, legal case. It's used in um, property uh, law schools and um, law schools and property class in North America to introduce students often to the concept of uh, first possession and property. And it really, you know, starts, you know, I think I, I, just, I came to think after a certain period of time working on this, you know, why are we using an, an animal to do this as a sort of really, you know, baking it in that yes, animals are property and yes, they. They're, um, the only real concern here is about which of these two people gets to have the animal. But there's an built-in entitlement to take the animal and kill the animal. Okay, so um, Gary Francione's book, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work, he made this famous argument about the need to move um, animals from property to persons, at least moral persons. And um, it's based on this idea, as long as animals are property, they will never lose um, sorry, they will lose in their interest, however significant, is balanced against the human interest, however insignificant. And I think this has been quite a profound thesis. It's really shaped a lot of people's thinking um, about um, animals and law. Um, but it, does, it did seem when I came, came upon it, um, this sort of insufficiently nuanced. Why? Well, because there's no reason why animal interests can be weighed more heavily in a balance. Um, and so I don't think the problem is the balancing per se. Um, and then the second problem is that the terrible treatment of non-human animals, it's not always a property problem. It's certainly true that property status facilitates terrible treatment. Um, but if you think of lots of um, cases, um, for example, sharks swimming in the sea, you know, they're, they're not anyone's property. I mean, they're, they're free living. Um, and, but why are people you know, using the fins for a shark fin soup? The problem is that their lives are being insufficiently respected. So I think that... Um, Property is often coming, but isn't the core concept um, the concept of insufficient respect? So we're kind of coming back to this idea of respect and dignity, and trying to figure out how to make it work. Um, how to make it work? Okay. Um, Stephen Wise, we've talked about a lot already today. Um, so when I uh, first met um, Steve Wise, it was back in 2018, and it was actually the um, uh, Oxford Summer School, and I just was coming from the summer school last week. I interviewed him there when I met him and, and, and published that interview. Um, his work uh, is obviously very important to, to people working in this area, especially in North America. Um, and um, But what was interesting about what Steve was doing is that he seemed to be saying, um, if you could get animals and move them and somehow sh you know shove them and push them over into personhood, like get a judgment to recognize it, um, then this was sort of going to be um, all, you, all you'd have to do. Um, and I think as we're hearing, um, it's not as, not, as, uh, not as simple as that. Um, but also, um, Steve was being criticized by scholars like Manisha Decca for um, using personhood and being too anthropocentric insofar as um, he was uh, relying too much on uh, personhood. Uh, my sense watching what was happening with these cases and the way the judges were reacting to the cases uh, was that person who was very triggering for them and created a real feeling of, um, of outrage um, in them, which wasn't helpful. So I called that the outrage factor, uh, where they were saying, no, not persons, not humans. Um, and you know, it was sort of understandable in a sense, because what they were hearing mostly was about evidence of, of how close to humans um, chimps were, um, and then the movement to, um, to elephants in more recent times. OK, then in terms of the historical work, so here, this is very interesting. And um, really, um, there's a very uh, excellent, distinct strain of scholarship emphasizing that while um, 19th century um, rights, um, which I call small r rights, that's where the little r is there, um, these were not the fundamental capital r rights of the 20th and 21st century. So what Raphael is calling fundament fundamental rights this morning in his speech. Um, but there are uh, rights that non-human animals have, and Suski Stuki calls these weak rights. So this is a point that, you know, uh, even welfare rights, weak rights, they're enough to say that non-human animals are persons. Okay, and this is very consistent um, also with Lisa's work as well. It's such a small room and everybody's here. It's so Because <laughs> <laughs> you just look down and you see them, here they are. Um, okay, so that's a very important insight, and Eva also argues this in her work. Okay, um, R.V. Chen, this is a Canadian case from Alberta. 
uh, which I thought I'd give you just as, to show you an example. I know everybody probably has these examples in their jurisdiction. Um, but there's this very distinct sense that even if non-human animals are still legally property, so everyone says, yes, they are property, um, they're not mere property. And this is um, a, just a, an illustrative quote about this from a, a Canadian court of appeal case. Smashing a pet through a window is not the same as smashing a window. Animals feel pain and suffer. They're not merely property, and they deserve protection under the criminal law. So here there's, there was this idea that you could say, well, in the same way that their personhood was attenuated, and we can attach the word quasi to that, we could say the same thing about property. That yes, they're property, but they're not mere property. And so um, there's a distinction there. Okay, so this seems to me to uh, be a very classic instance of a legal concept uh, that you find very well represented in all kinds of um, legal texts, um, such as the Dictionary, Black's Law Dictionary, uh, that neither of these categories were operating in their pure instances. And I think, Raphael, this morning you were talking about Bavarian ideal types. You know, we, the animals are really, they're like, they're like, they're not, they're just not fitting uh, really into either of these. They're a sort of or a kind of, a quasi uh, marking a resemblance, but also supposing a difference. And in the case of rights, um, those holding them are at least quasi persons, um, because how can they be non persons and still have rights? So they must be. They must be some kind of person, even if it isn't the sort that everybody wants and wants the judges to declare. On the property side, again, even welfare rights or welfare laws show that non-human animals are not mere property. So at best, or at most, they can be only quasi-property. So again, this is probably not going to be everything you want, but um, they can be absolute property. And so we just shouldn't be starting there. I, you know, it seems to me that an animal, animal law in the circles is kind of what, where we start. We start animals are property. But really, like, we should be starting a little further ahead than that with, like, well, you know, well, the, the, you know the, they're, they're, they're at least quasi-property. And then they also have rights, so then they're actually also at least quasi-persons. So that's why I put it quasi-property slash quasi-person. And then one of my students said to me at one point, that's kind of long, so why don't we just say quasi-hood? So that's what you do for the last few years is saying, is saying quasi-hood. Okay. Um, all right. So despite the fact that animal law scholars and practitioners alike, like Francione and Wise, tend to start the story like this, um, you know, it, it sort of matters how we tell our stories and how we start them. And the idea here is, well, why don't we start them with what we have, you know, what we, what we have at least, which isn't perfect, but it's better than uh, usually uh, poets put. Okay, um, so here um, I was going to tell you a little bit about just the way that um, one of my students tried to run this quasi-hood idea through the different categories of animals. And what she found was um, really it works very well for companion animals, okay, uh, because they already had so many uh, ways in which they're special family members and so on, divorce, custody, pet trust, sort of all these different things. Um, in terms of wild animals, um, again, um, we've got it working pretty well. Um, and why is that? Well, you know, it's actually interesting because the rule that Pearson imposed, you know, so when I started all of this, that capture rule, it basically says that you don't ever have um, absolute property in an animal until the animal is controlled and cannot escape. And so that's just telling you already that that's a qualified quasi kind of an interest that you have. And, it, it, and, it, and if you look at it from the point of view of, well, of the state land and then the ownership is based on the state land, that too is also not really ordinary style of ownership. So it's not perfect, but I think it works pretty well for, for wild animals. Um, the most challenging context is the farmed animals, of course, as it is for all of us in this work. Um, but we know they have some very weak rights. So in Canada, uh, they have very much less than they do in Europe, um, but we do have federal legislation on transport and humane slaughter, like the U.S., um, plus there, uh, we have a federal criminal code, so they're included there in terms of unnecessary suffering. Again, it's not ever used for farm animals, but in theory it could be, and some scholars argue it should be, and we have provincial legislation preventing distress, uh, the causing of distress. So, you know, it, it, I'm not trying to say it's any better. Sometimes people say to me, oh, animal on Canada is so good. It must, be so, it must be so good there. And I'm like, no, no, it's not. It's just as bad as it is everywhere else. But it's sort of just taking, you know, what, what we have in the jurisdiction, which many other people also have in their country's jurisdictions, and sort of trying to look at it in a, in a, in a more positive way. Okay, so um, this is not ideal. Um, you know, and I think some, for some people they might think, oh, this is, 
like, you know, like Manisha would say, it's not just using the problematic category of personhood, which is, is a problem because of the anthropocentrism, but you're also retaining the even more problematic category of property. So if you don't like this, you, you, know, you could have two reasons for not liking it. Um, but um, I think it is good as a bridging idea, um, it, precisely because it's, me it's really meant to be uncontroversial for lawmakers and, uh, and, and, and other legal scholars. Why is that? Well, because it's already true, and so it's descriptive to some extent. And um, then um, it's also normative insofar as it can allow us to imagine non-human animals out of absolute property, forcing the concession that non-human animals do have rights, but they have our rights, and I know Visa and Eva also agree with this, and then seeking to build up the strength of those rights. Um, I know Visa in your piece recently, you called this um, crowding out, that the rights could eventually crowd out the thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I read that, I, I, I very much agree with that. It's very sympathetic to this. Okay, um, now here um, uh, we did an empty circle, and um, this is the idea that, okay, it's both descriptive, could be normative, but also content free. And in that respect, again, you might be like, well, I know I want content. Um, but, if you, but, if you, but if we're thinking about how to use it, to, and especially if we're thinking about how to use it for natural entities, it's good that it's content free. And in fact, now that I look back on it, you know how we all have these. You know, we're all going to conferences together and reading each other's work and so on and so forth. I, I sort of feel like I, I might have been influenced quite a bit by, by Manisha Decker's idea that, you know, for her is very content full. So if you've read her book on legal beings, you'll see it's a lot about the vulnerability, the embeddedness, the embodiedness of humans, and, and, and or sorry, non-human animals, but also humans too. And of course, she's 100% right about that. I mean, you know, that is the situation for the non-human animals. It's the same for us. Um, but it's sort of more a question about, you know, for legal strategy, um, do we want there to be a lot of content built into it? And it might be, um, I'm not saying it's necessarily better, but it's another way of going at it to say, actually, it's good for it to not have content. And then you can build in either species-specific content along the lines of what Raphael was talking about this morning, or you could do it along the lines of Martha Nussbaum and her capabilities, um, or you could maybe even do it for individuals if it turns out that... Um, you know, Sandra, we were talking about Sandra earlier, you know, if it's, if, you know, she doesn't fit her species, and, and so you have to talk about her very much as an individual. That, um, you, could, you could use it for that, too. Okay, so the content freeness of quasi-hood um, might be good for the rights of nature, and why do I think that, or at least wonder about that? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I'm giving you so much, I feel like I'm overloading your brains, probably, <laughs> but it's just sort of what I'm, what I'm thinking about right now. Okay, first of all, I think putting person... Um, in the context of rights of nature, it's much less triggering uh, for uh, humans, not just human judges. I mean, we talk about judges a lot, but just, you know, like for regular humans, too, like you were talking about, you know, being one of the sweetest and the judges, you know, just for everybody kind of tends to have that reaction, I think. So it's less triggering. A river or mangrove, it's much more like a corporate empty vessel idea, you know, for corporations, which we don't seem to have too much problem with. And you're also not getting that effect that's sometimes called the uncanny valley effect, which is a weird feeling that can arise when something's a little bit too realistic or too close to human. So rivers, for example, as persons, that's been around for a while, nobody seems to really have too much problem with it, and so um, uh, this guy hasn't fallen. Secondly, because so much of the world is owned, and what isn't owned is conceptualized, actually using Pearson and the capture rule. So when we talk about deep sea mining, or we talk about asteroids in space, it's always a complete capture so it can't escape combined with uh, first in time or something like that. Um, so uh, that, is, that is going to be, um, that's, you know, just, just think you can just get, just throw the poverty out the window, maybe um, it might be, um, might not be possible. Uh, you, um, and, and furthermore, this idea that we talked about recently at a Brooks meeting, um, you know, in the US there are these scholars who do um, work in what's called progressive property. And they really should be including non-human animals and the environment in that. And because I remember at our meeting you made this comment, it's a bit hard to understand why they're not doing that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, something like this could be um, definitely an invitation to do that. Okay, um, there is an anthropocentric aspect to this for sure. Um, when we're talking about animals, their environment, okay. Um, it's also our human environment as well. Um, but I don't think it should be a problem that, you know, you, you kind of talk about something that would be good for both humans and non-humans. And then, you know, you can also talk about intrinsic worth and dignity and the need to respect that for, for all of our sakes. So um, there's the idea, the quasi-hood idea. I'm sorry it was so fast. Um, 
and um, the proposal, you know, to perhaps use it for the rights of nature. I'm, I'm very interested in hearing um, how that sounds to you.